very great pleasure to welcome you to Historical Society. Thanks for coming. If this is your first visit, please get to know us a little bit better and come back again. Um, this evening we have a, a real privilege. Audrey Peterman is with us. She sits on the National Board of the um, Parks Conservation Association. Conservation Association. Mm -hmm. And we have her here for Earth Day, but she's coming back and we're going to have a bigger crowd for next time. We're, we're nervous that there's mm -hmm. not a bigger crowd for you. We're so glad you're here. This is filmed, though, and we are starting to load these on YouTube. So you will have, a, we've even had requests. Senator Lemieux is very, very often has us uh, has his secretary call me the next day because he's he RSVPs and can't come, and so he wants to have these immediately at his disposal for some reason. So we are posting them as quickly as we can now so he can see what we're doing down here. So that said, please help me to welcome Audrey Peterman, our new friend. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much. I'm so glad that you took the time to be here this evening. I'm really so happy to, um, to be in this facility. My husband Frank and I walk by here very often, but this is the first time that we've been in, and we're very impressed. I mean, it's very beautiful and well-preserved, and I even mentioned the beauty of the drapery and was told that this lovely lady seated right here had a hand in putting it together, so congratulations to you. And I know that there are people in here who are very famous, including the lovely lady to her left, who I understand is writing a book about the, um, the history of, of the area. And I'm very, very appreciative of you, Tara. Tara and I met at the Climate March, right, in October or something, and um, we got to talking, and voila, today I get to be here. So by way of introduction, my title, Seminoles to Sea Level Rise, An Environmental History of Fort Lauderdale, I believe that you will agree with me that that is a very ambitious title, right? Seminoles to Sea Level Rise, that's kind of a long span of time. And I'd like to tell you how I got to this place. So my amazingly wonderful husband, Frank, who's sitting right there, I love that guy after 24 years of marriage, it's amazing. Um, back in 1995, we had this idea that because our last child from our blended family was graduating college, we thought about what we wanted to do with our lives. And we decided that we wanted to go live in Belize in Central America because Frank had seen a program on TV that talked about how much the Belizeans valued their land and their environment and how they believed that the land was the most precious thing that they had to pass on to their descendants. Well, my God, that resonated with us because we're that kind of people. So we decided we wanted to move there and open a bed and breakfast and go to bed at night with the sound of the howler monkeys in our ears kind of thing. That kind of romantic dream, right? And we went to Belize and, oh my God, we loved it so much. And the, we had pretty much decided we're gonna come home, sell our place and move back to Belize, move to Belize, and then, the last night before we left Belize, Frank was in a bar having a drink with a Belizean gentleman. He's often, he often finds himself in, himself in bars drinking, right? And they got, to talking, they got to talking about cowboy movies because they were about the same age and they grew up watching cowboy movies that were filmed with scenes of the Badlands. So the Belizean gentleman said to Frank, uh, so what do the Badlands look like? And Frank said, uh, I don't know. I've never been to the Badlands. And the gentleman said, but you live in America, right? And Frank said, yes, but I've never been to the Badlands. So then the gentleman said, okay, what does the Grand Canyon look like? And Frank said, ooh, I don't know that ever. I, I don't, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. So when we came home, Frank said, honey, you know, we cannot leave our country to go to anybody else's country and have people asking us questions about where we're from and we have no answer. So it is a particular pleasure for me to be back here in Fort Lauderdale speaking in this place of history at this time because that trip, we decided to take a trip around the country in 1995 and we left from Fort Lauderdale and drove all the way north to uh, Acadia National Park in Maine on the East Coast through the Badlands through Mount Rushmore, through Yellowstone. And actually it was while we were in Yellowstone and I was gawking at this incredible beautiful landscape and all the other incredible beautiful landscapes that we had seen up till then. And then I saw behind the word Yellowstone National Park. And then I realized that in Acadia I had seen National Park, Badlands National Park, 
Mount Rushmore National Park. So I said, what the heck is a national park? Because I did not know. Although I was college educated, nothing in my experience had told me that America has a system of national parks. So we continued around the country all the way to um, uh, the Pacific Northwest and Olympic National Park and the whole rainforest. I mean, did you even know that America has rainforest? I did not know that until I was in there. And I mentioned that because it was that trip around the entire country observing the incredible natural beauty of our country that is protected in something called the National Park System and seeing less than a handful of black people or Hispanic people or Native Americans in those incredible spaces, that's what set us on a mission to discover the entirety of the national parks and to bring the stories from the national parks back to our peers in urban communities so that they could be as inspired and amazed as we were. Then, as a secondary benefit, it is from traveling through the national parks. And I wish somebody would please ask me how many I've been to. Please, somebody ask me. 177 as of last week. So there are 410 in the system. And my goal is that in a very short time, I will have visited them all. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, along with the four units that we have here in South Florida, Everglades, Biscayne, the Big Cypress, and the Dry Tortugas, I'm hoping that by the time I've finished all 410, we will have added 200 more. Because I never want to run out of parks to visit. Because these places contain the historic and cultural legacy of our country. They are the places where history happened, and that's why they're part of the national park system. But now to hurtle forward to where we are today, um, I, I just want to mention that I like thinking back to the time when the Everglades was relatively undisturbed. And because my husband, Frank, grew up here in the 1940s, I can hardly say that you know, the Everglades was undisturbed at that time, but he does tell me frequently about the fact that he grew up playing with Seminole Indians in Dania, that when he was growing up, the Everglades came as far west as 441. Beyond that was Everglades. And I like to think of the environment and the lifestyle that the Seminole Indians might have, um, might have experienced in that landscape. So this picture doesn't do them any justice, of course. But that was something I pulled off the internet today to show, to give at least some indication of what the environment and the Everglades might have looked like while it was still relatively untouched and while Seminoles were abundant in that area. Now, as it happens, we live at Cooley's Landing right around the corner. And so I can look off my, I can stand on my deck and see this, uh, how do you say this? Plaque. Yeah, this plaque, right, that commemorates Cooley's massacre. And as you will see, it is on the spot where in 1824, William Cooley and his family were um, killed by Seminole Indians requiring the establishment of Fort Lauderdale in 1838. So I'm taking that as a relatively um, a midterm development since the Everglades was breached. Moving further on into time, I like to think of this sign. I, I often point to the sign, which is right outside this building, talking about old Fort, Lauder old Fort Lauderdale village. And I think that when we first met Tara, it was the thing I mentioned to you, that it was about time that the sign was redone because I noticed that it gave a lot of information about people such as um, uh, Philemon and Mr. Bryant, et cetera. But right here it says, in 1894, Philemon with his two sons, Storm and Reed, brought 400 African-American workers by boat from New Smyrna to build the roadbed. And it struck me that there really needs to be more about those 400 uh, men and who they were. So maybe it's time for this uh, sign to be upgraded. Because presumably, the establishment of the roadbed and the, ro the railroad, no, let's try that again, the railroad, yes, was the precursor to the massive development of the area. This picture is of Governor 
Napoleon Bonaparte Broward and his family near the turn of the 20th century when Governor Broward declared that he wanted to drain the Everglades and create an empire. That was in about 1905. And in the interval between the draining of the Everglades and the development of Fort Lauderdale and this area into the place known as the Venice of the Americas, there was the reordering of society and the forcible um, maintenance of a particular system of society in which, for example, African Americans were not allowed to go to the beach in Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to cycle back to this because you're not going to believe that this is very much in the news at this moment. As a result of the insistence of African Americans in this area, such as Von D. Mizell and Eula Johnson, these are people who are very much in the lexicon of Fort Lauderdale, the African Americans were given this beach, the colored beach, on John U. Lloyd, it was named after Broward attorney John U. Lord, who helped to assemble the land for that beach. From what I hear, it was a relatively noxious um, beach. One lady whom I interviewed for a story I did for the West Side Gazette a couple of weeks ago told me that to this day, in her 60s, she still wears shoes on the beach because they had to go over so many sand spurs. As a child, they had to cross all these sand spurs to, um, to get to the water. And this beach is very much in the news. You know what they say about the past never being dead? It's always with us. This beach is very much in the news right now because a bill signed by Governor Scott will rename that park from John U. Lloyd State Park, and it will be renamed the Von D. Mizell Eula Johnson State Park as of the 1st of July. Now one of the key things that strikes me as an environmentalist about this beach is that it was a barrier island. Are you referring to Hugh Taylor Birch? No, John U. Lloyd. Yes, yes, yes. One of the key things that, that strikes me about this is barrier island. Yes, it's a barrier island and now we know barrier islands are vitally important to protect us from storm surge and sea level rise. However, in this area now, practically all our, all our barrier islands are, are developed. And it must have been considered a very noxious beach to be given to the blacks in the, 50s, in the 1950s. Still, now it's coming back into prominence and we will have to wait and see what effects the, uh, the change in climate has on that area. This is a picture of Virginia Key Beach in uh, Miami. And I should have told you that I'm going to take the liberty of skipping around quite a bit in Florida because if you're talking about the environment of this area of Fort Lauderdale, it is impossible for us to stick to just, you know, uh, this small spit of land because the environment is tied together and will be equally affected by the climate change and sea level rise that we're now facing. But this beach, uh, Virginia Key in Miami, was the colored beach in the Jim Crow era as well. It was also a barrier island, and it was given, um, it was the, the, the beach that was where the black people were allowed to swim. Now, this beach is also very much in the news this week. It really almost freaked me out last week when I read that the Miami-Dade County has now given permission, and I believe the work is now underway, to drill 10 thousand feet down on Virginia Key, okay, to create a well below the aquifers to store sewage as a cost-saving measure. I mean, how is this even possible? Still, it's what's happening today. Now, in the interim, while all of that was happened, we developed Fort Lauderdale into this is not the best, it does not translate into the best picture, but we know that we're developed wall to wall, correct? And we know that development continues right along the waterfront. So, it's about, let's say in 1905, Governor Broward declared 
that he wanted to make us into an empire. And I believe you'll be a little surprised to hear that in 2015, in an article in the New Yorker, the mayor of Miami, Miami Shores, who is also a biologist at Florida Atlantic University, was quoted in an article in the New Yorker saying, we will not be able to keep the water out of parts of South Florida and we may need to start to look at orderly depopulation. When I read that, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because you don't often hear a person who depends on votes for his job saying something that so closely corroborates with what the scientists have been saying for a long time, that in fact, South Florida is in the bull's eye for climate change and sea level rise. I don't know how many miles of coastline Fort Lauderdale has, but I think it's a significant amount. And so what happens in Miami happens in Fort Lauderdale, happens in the Keys. It happens regionally. And so it strikes me as really bizarre that in the community I live in and the people I talk to that include newspaper publishers, that includes journalists, that includes you know, um, educators, I am not hearing a conversation about where we are and how we are going to deal with the effects that are projected to be upon us, not in 2100, as a lot of people smugly think. You know, people actually say to me, well, I'm not gonna be here when it happens, so I don't really care. But these effects are projected to be upon us within 15 years. Now, I'd like to say that Frank and I and our friend Al Calloway have been working with the Everglades Coalition, which includes state and local representative and representatives and federal representatives since 1995 to restore the Everglades. Okay, so think about this. We have the federal government, we have the state government, we have local government, we have more than 50 environmental organizations from across the country working since 1995 and even before to restore the Everglades. In February, January and February, we experienced more waterfall. I'm told that we had three times the rain that we generally get at this time of year. Three times the rain that we get at this time of year resulted in the South Florida Water Management District having to back pump water from off the cake polluted agricultural fields into Lake Okeechobee and send it out into the Caloosahatchee estuary and into the St. Lucie estuary, which then caused tremendous fish scales and had a tremendous negative impact on tourism and business. At the same time, in the Everglades, there are, there's a Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. I heard so much about that little sparrow in the 1990s. The whole Everglades restoration plan was designed to keep that threatened bird alive and in existence. Well, as a result of three times the water in January and February, now the birds are drowning. Or their nesting areas are being flooded in the Everglades. So the point I'm making is, if there has been so much impetus and interest going into restoring the Everglades for all of these years, and not a hurricane to which we are prone, but just a little bit of extra rain can have such devastating negative consequences. Are we not sitting in the bull's eye being really stupid and unconcerned if we're not getting about the business of working with our elected officials to tell us what is going on, what is the prognosis, and what are we going to do to protect ourselves? This is the message that I wanted to bring to you this evening, that while Cooley and his family dealt with the threat from the Seminole Indians at the time, and while Fort Lauderdale was constructed to protect the people from that threat of the Native Americans, the indigenous people, the threat that we face today is much more immediate, 
vicious and vital. And at this point, I really don't see that we're making any efforts to um, address it. And I'll tell you, in the same article in the New Yorker, the mayor of Miami Beach, a gentleman I respect and admire, he's done a lot already to raise the, he's raising streets in Miami Beach and putting in pumps. Of course, the pumps are pumping the water off of the street into Biscayne Bay, then affecting the marine life. So it's, I don't know what the situation, eh, what, what the win-win situation is. But um, that gentleman was quoted as saying, you know, it's not as though we have a book or a manual for how to deal with sea level rise and climate change. So we're going to have to figure it out as we go along. But then he said, never mind, because we have to protect investor confidence and we have to protect resident confidence. I'm like, uh, excuse me, that's like being really stupid if you're just going to be protecting confidence but not doing anything to save us from the, um, the, the effects. And then he said, to compound things, he said, well, you know, 20 years ago, if somebody had told you that you could look at your device on your wrist and talk to somebody halfway around the world, you would have told them, not possible. So we never know, technology might save us. And I'm like, Mr. Mayor, I don't think you're going to be able to swipe back the Atlantic or swipe back the Gulf. It's just not going to work like that. So here's a, here's a headline from an article in which I was quoted. I think this was in about two months ago. Rising seas pull Fort Lauderdale, Florida's building boom town toward a bust. The Venice of America is expecting its population to grow by a third, but it already can't handle the impacts of climate change. And as I mentioned, we live on our sailboat at Cooley's Marina. And so in the four years we've been there, we have seen the change at high tide, and especially in the equinox, the king tides, the water is not only over the seawall, but it's way up in people's backyards. In the marina, we can hardly get to the bathrooms without you know, wearing water boots. That's how high the tide, the water is now. In the same article, it mentioned that the population is expected to grow by a third, and this was quoting the mayor, of Fort Lauderdale, the population is expected to grow by a third, more than 50,000 people in the next 15 years. Nearly 5,500 apartments and condos are or will soon be under construction, and developers are seeking to build another 2,400 units in the next few years. The city processed 26,000 building permits with a construction value of 1.8 billion last year alone. Scientists, city officials, planners, and policymakers say that in the coming decades, climate change will impact nearly every aspect of life in Fort Lauderdale and the rest of South Florida, from the price of, the price of flood insurance to home values, drinking water, supplies, infrastructure, the economy, and health. And this was from that one was from the National Geographic uh, 2015. Four southern counties, Monroe, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach are home to about one-third of Florida's population. And about 2.4 million people live less than four feet above the high tide line. The streets of Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, and Miami Beach often flood during the occasional king tides, which are much higher than normal high tides. Now here's a clincher. The oceans could rise two feet by 2060, according to the National Climate Assessment, as their waters warm and expand, and as the polar ice sheets melt. By 2100, seas could rise as much as 6.6 .6 feet. That would put much of Miami-Dade underwater. For every foot the sea rises, the shoreline would move inland 500 to 2,000 feet. A two foot, here's the clincher for me. A two foot rise would be enough to Trans the Miami Dade County Student Treatment Plant on Virginia Key and the nuclear power plant at Turkey Point, both on Biscayne Bay. Just last week, the nuclear power point on B at Turkey Point was found to be leaching radioactive isotopes into the water of Biscayne Bay. 
And this gentleman, the chairman of the University of Miami's geology department says, at two feet they will be sitting out in the ocean. Most of the barrier islands will be uninhabitable. Now, does it strike you? I mean, does this sound like it's, does it strike you that this is something we should be discussing amongst ourselves? That this is conversations that we should be having in our neighborhood associations with our elected officials? This is, this should be, if this is even likely to be real, and we have every reason to know because the scientists are unequivocally, you know, agreed on this, except for those, of course, who, uh, those persons seeking high office who have a vested interest who say, I'm not a scientist, so I don't, I don't believe. I mean, when did science become optional? You know, you can believe it or not. It's like, you, you, take it or leave it. It's only science, you know. So it, the fact that we're not having a robust conversation about this and that citizens are, for the most part, unaware makes me very concerned that we will not be knowledgeable enough or prepared to act in our own best interests in time. I was at a meeting in a conference in uh, DC a couple weeks ago where the sage young man in his 20s made the observation, we are the ancestors of the future. It is us, we are the people that future generations whose lives are tremendously compromised by the negative impact we have had on our environment, whether by omission or commission, whether by commission or omission, you know, no, the fact that we did not know will not be an excuse that's acceptable. We are here in the age of information. If we do not inform ourselves and use that information to make our environment better, there really will be no, um, no salvation for us. I don't know why the word salvation comes to mind. There will be no salvation. There will not be forgiveness for us. How can we be so complacent? In January, I spoke on a panel at the Everglades Coalition Conference, and one of the people on the panel was the vice mayor, Stephen Shelley, from Homestead. And everyone else on the panel talked about how happy they were about the area's tourism and how happy they were that money has just been released from Congress to buy land below Oke Lake Okeechobee, which will help with the restoration of the Everglades. But when I talked about the fact that we have less than 15 years, according to Climate Central, to look at how we will adapt to climate change, what are the structures, if any, that we can put in? What is the depopulation going to look like that the mayor is talking about? What are we going to do instead of being sitting ducks? And the, the vice mayor of Homestead said, you know what? Elected officials only respond when their constituents are knocking on their doors or when everybody I'm meeting in the public domain is talking to me about, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do? And it really shocked me because I thought that we elected people to have the long-term view and to take care of, or to see the problem coming ahead, okay, and to help us, to tell us how to deal with it. Well, I should have been less confident about that because in 2005, Frank and I were living in Fort Lauderdale where he was serving as the regional director of the Wilderness Society, which is a national organization that protects wilderness on public lands. And we were invited to an environmental event at which the speaker in August 2005 told us that he had just come back from New Orleans 
and he had gone up on a helicopter ride with city leaders and members of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They had gone out over the levees because they knew and they had known for some time that the levees could not stand up to a Category 5 hurricane. And then he said the words that chilled me so much that for years I didn't talk about, I didn't, I didn't ever repeat it. But now I feel that we're in a situation where I have to speak it because people have to be shocked out of complacency to take action. He said, we know that the dikes will not hold and so they have bought a thousand body bags and put them in storage. Two weeks later, Katrina hit. And I saw how they used those body bags. And if you Google it on CNN, you will find that they had to buy 25,000 more body bags. I don't know that they used them all, but they certainly had to. So their response to a foreseeable threat was to buy body bags and put them in storage. Now, I would not say that that would be the response of our venerable city and county leaders. I would not want to think of that of them because some of these people are among my closest friends. At the same time, however, the lack of activity, the lack of information, the lack of a coordinated response really alarms me. And I hope I have not alarmed you too much, but I would like to say that in Fort Lauderdale, we have such an amazingly beautiful place, such an amazingly wonderful quality of life. And I am certain that some of you who have been here for a while have noticed the changes and have noticed the intense development that is happening, the fact that the water cannot run off the streets. You know, we have flooding. Doesn't everybody know that the more you build, the more concrete you put on the earth, the less place there is for water to go down into the aquifer, and so obviously the more flooding we'll have? But in my experience, in the 20 years that we've been working in the environmental sector in this area, I have seen there is a tremendous lack of accountability. Things change every four years or so, and people do their jobs, and then they move off the scene, and the next person comes, and there's no continuity, there's no long-term plan. So I'm saying, I have 19 grandchildren. I really care passionately about what happens to them, and I really feel that you know, it is the very least I can do to give my life's energy to making people aware that we can no longer be complacent. It is up to each one of us to educate ourselves about what is happening, about the environment right now, and what we can do to affect the future of our environment positively. Otherwise, future generations will damn us. Thank you. So that was probably not what you're accustomed to hearing at the <laughs> Historical Society. Oh yeah, wait, I should tell you what we did about this though. I didn't finish. So what time is it anyway? We're good? Okay, yeah. So just to let you know, you know, Frank and I are not just sitting around um, talking about problems in order to, yeah, really. In order, to, in order to help alleviate the problem, we gathered 50 of our closest friends from across the country, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, um, from one end of the country to the other, and created a, speaking, a speaker's bureau called the Diverse Environmental Leaders Speaker's Bureau. And some of these people are all climate scientists, ecologists, outdoors people, green energy people. You know, and we have a website called Diverse Environmental Leaders that we encourage people to go to and get some of these people to come and talk to communities about how they can prepare for, um, for climate change. To our great delight, this young family, they have a foundation called Green and Youth Foundation. And as a result of our efforts, they have been training an entire youth core of people, young people to work in the national parks and forests across the country and r over the weekend they were in the Grand Canyon negotiating to get young urban people to have internships in the Grand Canyon and to be able to work um, in that area. This is our friend Stephen Shobo Shobi, one of our key speakers and he was featured in AAARP magazine this month as um, part of the 100th anniversary issue 
And Stephen is, he's 59 now, he's a mountaineer. He has climbed four of the highest mountains on earth and narrowly missed the top of Mount Denali, which is the highest mountain on the North American continent, a couple years ago because the mountain is 20,320 feet high and him and his team of young urban, young black people, men and young men and young women, got to the 19,700 foot point and then weather turned them back. Can you believe that? So now he has to go do it all over again. <laughs> yes, and okay, so these are our two books that we have written. The Legacy on the Land really delves intensely into our discovery of the national parks and then our commitment to the environment and particularly what we did here in, in Broward County to help raise awareness and to get more people involved. And Our True Nature is um, about my top favorite 59 units of the national park system. So, I think we're done. Yes. Thank you. I have a quick, I was so glad you brought up that pumping uh, because it seems that when I read in the newspapers, the one thing that our government officials think is going to fix it is the are these pumping stations they're sitting at, and it doesn't. I, I'm really glad you addressed the environmental impact to our marine industry. Yes. But it just seems like uh, it's like a plunger. I mean, you know, I mean, like you know, I've got a plumbing problem at home. It just, it just doesn't. And it seems to be the only thing they are doing, you know, because uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale has addressed that several of the neighborhoods in the low-lying districts. Yes. These wonderful new pumps they put in. Some of them are on Las Olas and Isles. But what is the uh, environmental impact? Do we need to worry about pollution in those things? Do we need to worry about what that's pumping out into our seawater and our brackish water in the uh, in, in those inlets and in those in those very on the islands? where folks live. I mean, I don't think I've heard anything about that. One of the, one of the things I wanted to try to do was to give you a, a fairly cohesive picture of what's going on. The biggest problem of all, of course, is that we're addressing this on a piecemeal basis because the governor of our state, it is commonly understood across the country. You know, people, when I go, when I, people know I'm from Florida, you should see the abuse I have to take, okay? Because, because they're like, your governor, you know, who has outlawed the words climate change, as if directing state employees not to use the words climate change will make it go away, you know, because it's magic, you know. So, so, unfortunately, yes, it's a piecemeal approach to a regional and national problem, you know. So the state of Florida should be addressing the issue of climate change as a state and sea level rise as a state. But... You know, some of the counties are working together now to address it, but there is no cohesive national, I mean, state plan. And I'll tell you, in November, a national report was issued on where each state is, where each state ranks on its preparations for flooding. Guess what grade Florida got? It blew my mind. Guess what grade we got? Minus. F like fail. And California got an A, so it is possible to get an A. What, what makes the people in California different from us? What makes them stand up, okay, and interact with their government so that they can get an A? Why is it that we in Fort Lauderdale are different and we will, you know, settle for an F? Do you know what the ramifications of an F will be on our um, land and water and people? It's not good. So we should really step up to that. You know, now I'm recommending to people, People need to be, and I heard this on a panel, I was on a panel in Miami on Friday, and this gentleman made a presentation about how there was a, an open space in his community that was suddenly being looked at to be rezoned as a, as a house, as a develop, housing development. And he said that he get, him and his neighbors got together and pushed back against it. So. And, and then it was, it was developed as a greenway with bicycle, bicycle paths, et cetera, and the, the housing development was turned back. So the point I want to make is, I'm encouraging people, we need to be organizing in our neighborhoods, in our housing associations, our neighborhoods, our you know, cities. We need to have somebody at City Hall. We need to have somebody at the zoning board. My husband always says, you know, the zoning board is where change happens. We need to be monitoring what happens at the zoning board. If you walk along to the end of Riverwalk to Las Olas Boulevard and see that gigantic building that is going up there, we walk, we've walked past it several mornings after it's rained. 
This building is going up right beside the Stranahan Historic House. It's on the water. And we're walking on Riverwalk, and we have to go across the street because the new river is in the street. And yet there's a building going up on the river, a huge building. You know, one of the things that uh, has to be done is a lot of people believe that the South Florida Water Management District um, is the cure-all for our water problems. And yes, the Water Management District is responsible for the 16 counties um, south of Orlando, all the way down to the Keys. However, sea level rise and storm surge are way beyond the capabilities of the South Florida Water Management District. We need to have people talking about building and development, where we're going to build and where we're not going to build. You know, where we're going to leave for the water. Where are we going to channel the water? The mayor from Miami Shores, the one who said we need to be talking about depopulation, one of the things that freaked him out, he said he was walking his dog and he, was at a par he went to a park across the street from his house and he saw fish swimming in the park. So that really blew his mind because where did they come from? But as we know, the uh, Biscayne Aquifer from which we get our drinking water is porous. So not only is the water going to be coming down and across, but it's coming through, it's, you know, the ocean is pushing into the aquifer. We already have tremendous um, problems with keeping up head pressure so that the sea does, we don't have, you know, increasing levels of salt water intrusion in our wells, etc. So we could do like the mayor of Miami Beach says, and to, we cannot disrupt consumer confidence. We cannot disrupt investor confidence. Let's all just be sitting ducks. And when it comes, we say, oh, what happened? You know, but I, I write prolifically about this. I blog for the Huffington Post, and I write in the West Side Gazette and the South Florida um, Times. And I really am doing everything that I can to let people know, no, you cannot be complacent. Because if you're complacent, the outcome is going to be very, very bad. Like body bags bad. Sorry. How will we be for time, Tara? Good. Um, there's a lady who's just coming in. Yes. And um, if there's any, I mean, we have time for questions. Yes, OK. I have no idea what time it is. I could use my phone. Oh, what did you say? Oh, OK. Yes. Would one of the answers be to create a very active green space board that will help us? and goes to their homeowners and present green space ideas. Do it at that level you know, where the developers can still hear and the people in the area are here. We are going to need green space. Like another park board district. Shouldn't we be preparing by having these park boards go around and try to produce it and our thought? Yes, it's just in keeping some green space everywhere now. We do not can stop the development. Right. But in our case, where we're getting developed, we, they keep saying, well, what are, you, what are you thinking? And if we said, we want some green space, this is just a perfect time to just do that, you know, to get in there. To answer your question, I would say all of the above. We need to be proactive. We need to be doing everything that we can. One to make our elected officials alert us, inform and educate us about what is to come, what the prognosis is. The show, yeah. yeah, what the studies show, exactly. Because it's still a study. Yes, but uh, I think it's proven. They've been telling us, they've been telling us about this. I have, I've been, you know, studying this since 1995, and it's only accelerating. There is nowhere in the literature, and you know, we have Google as a search engine and multiple search engines now. We can look up whatever we want. But there is nothing that is saying the effects of climate change are receding. Everything is saying they're accelerating. So, you know, but I would say that that idea is, a, is an excellent one. And we need people to think. This is what needs to happen. We need people to be thinking about it and then communicating with their elected, uh, their neighborhoods and their elected officials about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to see that my friend, Ms. Giles, came in. I, I invited her in particular because remember when I mentioned the uh, John U. Lloyd Park and the fact that it's going to be renamed? 
Miss Giles and her mother and her father went to that park when they were um, when when she was a young woman. And in fact, her her dad had a boat and he transported people across to the island before the road was built. And they've been very Dr. Giles, I should say. Yes. Hello, Mrs. Giles. Wow. Yes, honey. Uh, I'd like to add one other thing that you might want to consider. I was amazed at how these buildings could be going up in areas that are, there's no question we're going to have a catastrophe in the interior. And I kept saying, well, why are they building? How can they keep building? Where, how can you go into a bank and get money to build a multi billion dollar building? How can you pass a feasibility? When if it's 30 years to pay for it, in 15 years it's going to be underwater. Yes. Water. What's, what's going on here? Well, and, and what's going to happen is they're going to bankrupt the federal uh, uh, insurance system. Insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Yeah. And when they bankrupt that, there will be nothing left for homeowners. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody, because uh, Swiss rate has already said, we're not going to be able to pay. If, if something isn't done, we will not be able to pay out all that we need to pay out to protect people. So one of the things that, the reason I say you need to be at the zoning meeting is that's where the change. The zoning board makes a recommendation that the city or the county commission then wrote a standard. So we need to begin to get in touch with where these decisions are being made. Because you may say we can't stop the development, but we need to try it because what is going to be devastating what's going to happen to local homeowners once all of the insurance money is being eaten up by it. And I think it is a crime for a bank to approve a loan for a building they know that's going to not be underwater by the before you can satisfy the mortgage. Yes, the literature on that is, is very strong. It turns out that Florida is more invested in the federal flood uh, insurance plan, I think we're three times as invested as the next state, which is Texas. So we, are, we have the most um, of that insurance pool. But I don't know that you know, even that will protect us. Everyone agrees that construction is a big part of our economic engine. And considering that we live on a peninsula, it does not seem logical to me that we could think we could just keep going constructing from you know the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico although we have pretty much succeeded in doing that except for that little sliver of Everglades that we that we have left but it's it's going to be very important for us to deal with that because it nobody's saying that construction has to stop we might need to construct differently we might need to be thinking like Holland for example and I did read an article when I was doing my research this evening about um, a consultant from Holland who was talking about the fact that we need to have businesses on stills, I mean how homes we need to be building on stills in the water. I don't know how that's going to go, but I'm saying if these effects, as Climate Central says, storm, the combination of storm, sea level rise and storm surge, not to mention storm surge from a hurricane, okay, in 15 years or so will be poised to wipe out 2.1 million people who live along the coastlines and several billion, billion dollars in infrastructure. Now, I also recognize that, to a large degree, this might sound like too big a problem for us. But in a democracy, it is said, you get the kind of government and presumably the kind of results that you go after. If so many of our people are uninformed and so many are watching... Uh, celebrity movies or what's that thing called? You know, where it's acting. Reality TV. Reality TV. If so many of our people are so unengaged with the political and civic process, how can we have a democracy that works and survives? And, you know, I am not one to point the finger because I, you know, I, I believe that as soon as I start pointing the finger, I become part of the problem. So I expend all of my energy to bring the information in the most palatable way I know how, but to tell the truth as I see it. Because my perspective is informed by that national perspective. As I said, last week I was in um, Seattle, Washington, 
And I had the great privilege of going to my 177th unit of the National Park System. I explained that going to the National Parks is how I became an environmentalist in the first place. And I just have to tell you this heartwarming story. I was at a park called the Bainbridge Island Japanese Relocation Memorial. And this particular place was one of the places where Japanese citizens were moved out off of their land um, at the beginning of World War II when uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and they were taken to uh, Manzanar and Minidotka uh, internment sites. And this story is so vastly different and heartening because the people in those communities who were left behind, the white Americans, they were so much in solidarity with their Japanese neighbors that they even paid the taxes on their houses. They kept their stories alive. They kept, you know, they kept in touch with them and you know, kept telling the community what was going on with them. They paid their taxes so that at the end of the internment process, at the end of the war, these people were able to come back and resume their lives. And it was interesting because our tour was led by two beautiful ladies in their 80s, and one had been seven, one was seven and one was five. They were sisters when they were taken away. And here's the heartening part of the story for me. You know how as a parent, you try to keep your child from all the negative stuff? These ladies told us that as children, they really had no idea what was happening. Their, children, their parents, you know, strove to make certain that they had a childhood that was not, um, overclouded with the, with the viciousness of what had happened to them. And I was just really so happy to see that because they had no trace of animosity or bitterness in them. And it was just an incredibly wonderful sight. But I have to tell you this since I started telling you that story. The gentleman who arranged to get the memorial built to honor the 200 people that had been taken away told us this story that gave me the chills. He said that in 2002, when they got the plot of land to dedicate to the people, the, the land is surrounded by tall pine trees. And he said there were 750 people on the property, you know, coming to the sacred moment of breaking ground for the memorial and, you know, talking about the people. And they decided to call the names of all 200 people that had been removed, even the smallest child. And he said, when they started calling the first name, a crow flew in to the tree, the pine trees, and started cawing. And he said, more, as they called out the names, more and more crows just came into, flooded the pine trees, and cawed, and cawed, and cawed, till they drowned out the, the, the PA system. And he said, you would be hard pressed to believe it, but when they went back and played the recording, the crows started cawing when they called the first name and they all stopped and flew away when they called the last name. Wow. And these people believe that the crows embody the spirits of their ancestors. That's part of their traditional belief. So how amazing is that? I love going to the national parks. It just really makes me so happy. So, and I love Fort Lauderdale. So let's try to keep some of it going, you know, because we can. Yes. Yeah, I congratulate you for the efforts you're making. Thank it's you. A, a very worthwhile, I'm sure, because we all will suffer otherwise. Unfortunately, I have to agree with you, our politicians don't seem to be tuned to these problems that the scientists keep telling us. Uh, however, as an individual, I feel sort of helpless uh, because if the people that represent me don't, don't wish to hear what I have to say, then who am I going to go to? Yes. And I congratulate you for doing your effort. And because we have a wonderful history, really, in Fort Lauderdale. This was wilderness a little over 100 years ago. Exactly. And, and it's developed into one of the most beautiful cities in the world, most livable cities in the world. And yet, it could all go by way of Atlantis. <laughs> yes. Well, I, would, I totally agree with you that sometimes it can, it can seem overwhelming for an individual. However, thankfully, there are lots of groups and organizations that are working on this issue. Um, 100 Friends of Florida, uh, the Everglades Trust, there are lots of organizations. You know, by 8 o'clock most mornings, I have sent off six or eight petitions to my elected officials from the state of Florida to Congress, you know? Because I get so many, 
I get so many emails about things that need to be done, about places my voice needs, sign this petition, etc. And, you know, that is getting a little tiresome as well because you, you really wonder what the effect is. But for the moment, I have nothing except my voice, which I can amplify, and to be part of a group or an organization that's going to collect all of these signatures and present them to an elected official to press a certain point of conservation. So I do that because it's what I can do. Yeah, I, um, I'm very much attached to Nova Southeastern University, yes. which is a private, not-for-profit research university. Yes. And they're building uh, beautiful buildings with uh, bringing in scientists, even from abroad, to teach our young people uh, about the environment, about water management, engineering in the Everglades. Yes. Uh, the the um, um, essence in research of the coral reef, which is a system that has practically, practically died out because of our garbage and our interaction with them in the wrong way. So all of these, there are efforts being made in the academic world. Yes. Which hopefully will will help uh, diminish the problem in the medium to long run, but in between there it is worrisome. I don't know what, uh, what more, you know, we don't have the knowledge yet about coral reefs. We don't have the knowledge about some of the Everglades problems of engineering of the, the water structure. The, pour out the water from Lake Okeechobee, then it affects the rivers, exactly. and it affects the wildlife. Right. Well, there is the microcosm to the macrocosm, right? And on the macrocosmic level, we are in an election cycle where really big decisions will be made, and there's a really big difference in the people who are seeking office, some of whom don't, I mean, actually refute in. I don't believe, I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't believe in climate change. You know, so that gives us an umbrella to make a decision one way or the other on the macrocosmic level. Because President Obama has actually laid out a very efficient climate plan that would reduce our dependence on um, fossil fuels and increase our uh, ability to use renewable fuels. Now, of course, the people in the dirty fossil fuels industry, and you know we're all guilty to a degree, um, are, I think the Supreme Court has taken up that, that charge. So instead of striving to clean our air, instead of striving to conserve, there are people who are actually on the side of continuing to ditch, drill, dike, and put more pollutants into the atmosphere. So that gives us a very clear um, choice and an opportunity to use our voices to say, hey, we cannot go down the road of continuing to um, have our environment deteriorate. We have to take, you know, if, my, if somebody tells me my house is on fire or I can see smoke, I don't care what the cause is. Get the water hose and get the fire department and put it out, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I think it's wonderful that we use tires instead of trying to make uh, uh, barriers out of the water or environment for the coral reef that we're using them to hold the barrels uh, along the highways where construction's going on. That's what's keeping those flimsy little barrels planted to the ground is just the rubber of the, the wall of the truck tires mainly. Mm. And that's a wonderful way of recycling it and, and keeping the environment. Well, you're, uh, you are evidently a knowledgeable and involved citizen. And no doubt, and I, I certainly hope you are spreading that knowledge and proacti proactive approach to people in your circle. Very much a believer in recycling. I don't Excellent. want to leave a bad footprint Excellent. to, to posterity. No. So every one of us has you know, influence in our sphere. You know, We can either have influence that says, no, I don't know, we can't do anything about it, or no, I, I let somebody else take care of it, or we can take a hold of the problem and recognize our power as citizens of these great United States. That's why I do this, because when I'm out in the national parks and I see what our ancestors had to go through to create this country, I have to tell you one last story. So, if you, who's been to um, Valley Forge National Historical Park? Have you been? Awesome, I love that place. And it was not until I went there the second time that I learned that when George Washington um, 
and his continental army camped out in that uh, area in the dire winter of 1777 to 78, I mean, when they didn't even have their supply lines, right? When the soldiers actually left bloody footprints on the snow because they didn't have shoes, they didn't have anything. And when I found out that there were black men in that army and Hispanic men and Native Americans, I was like, are you joking me? I did not learn this in the history books. But it gave me such a passion for America because I feel invested in it. I have legacy, I have history, I had a part in this, and therefore I must do everything within my power to keep this democracy thriving and moving forward. I will and I must. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Giles. I'm just like, I'm so glad you didn't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I just wanted to mention something and to clarify something. Um, Nova's beautiful oceanographic institute, you know, is located on that island that was that uninhabitable island that um, that housed the, the Black Beach at one time. Johnny, what is it on Johnny? Johnny yeah. Boyce. Really? Yeah. That's right. It's Almost one day by Zell, Nova Johnson. Yeah. It's the same, absolutely the same area. And um, um, the, not a note that a lot of people know that the city of Fort Lauderdale actually paid for a ferry to transport black citizens from Fort Everglades to that island, mm -hmm. starting, I believe, during the 50s and ending in 1964. Huh. Because I had asked my mom, who probably can't say it now, but when, during, my, during my first year of college, I came home, and I said to mom, whatever happened to that little ferry we used to take to the beach? And I used to like riding that ferry. And mom said, we didn't take that ferry that because we had to, we wanted to. We took it because we had to. We wow. weren't allowed to go to Fort Lauderdale Beach. And I had no idea. Yeah, See, question. again, my point, how parents keep the bad from their children, you know? And at the same time, I, I, I am sometimes concerned about that because if the children don't know, then you have that gap where they're not pressing forward to that, you know, to that ultimate goal of equality and justice for all, which is our founding principle. And I, I hope I mentioned that Dr. Giles and Mrs. Giles, Dr. Giles' father, Mrs. Giles' former husband, who died last year, right? September 11, right? September 11. Yes, yes. yes. Wow, yes. wow. And he, he will have a pavilion in the new, in the Von D. Maisel, uh Eula Johnson Park. It's the boat ramp, actually. The boat ramp, very appropriate, named in his honor, come July 1st, so... Celebrities, thank you so much for all your family has done for us. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you. Thank you.